Uh, good morning, everyone. In the series of uh, lectures, uh, fantastic lectures going on. Uh, today is an another day when we will discuss endocrine drugs in palliative care. And this this uh, this lecture, uh, so, uh, I request Dr. Susan to uh, Dr. Jennifer to introduce Susan. But before that, I just want to say few words about Dr. Jennifer. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Jeva, you must have realized that every Monday morning, uh, she is uh, she is giving you some or the other important uh, points or comment in all the lectures. So that's what Dr. Jennifer Jeva is. She is a thorough academician uh, and very uh, knowledgeable person in the area of palliative medicine. She is professor and head of the department of palliative medicine at CMC Valor. She is also an honorary, honorary senior lecturer in School of Medicine, Cardiff University. She is also the joint recipient of Dan Cicely Saunders Medal from Cardiff University in 2008. She has got a lot of publication in national and international journals. And her key area of interest are respiratory palliative medicine, strengthening primary palliative care, and communication skill and ethics. And you must have also seen her asking many times that sent for call for pre-conference workshop in 2023. So this is what the Dr. Jennifer Jeva is. She's also helping in various initiatives throughout India uh, for development of palliative medicine. And on personal front, she's extremely humble and a thorough mental person. So Dr. Jennifer, I request you to introduce Dr. Susan and please start. Everyone is waiting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sushma, for that uh, extra generous words. Uh, uh, so it's my pleasure today to uh, introduce Dr. Susan. So Dr. Susan um, has uh, done her fellowship in uh, palliative medicine uh, with us in the year 2016 to 2017. Then she went on to do her MD in radiation oncology. She's interested in uh, palliative medicine and has joined us back as a faculty after her completion of uh, MD radiotherapy. She's uh, very hardworking and sincere person and has uh, put in a lot of effort to prepare this presentation. As you realize, it's a very broad topic. Uh, each of uh, each of uh, these subtopics itself deserve a lecture on their own. So I'm afraid how we will be able to do justice, but we'll uh, try and cover as much as possible. And um, please uh, engage and put in your comments and your questions in chat. We'll take them at the end. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Susan, you can start. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. Today's lecture is on endocrine drugs in palliative care. I am Susan Shekina, and I work as a senior resident in palliative medicine de department, Christian Medical College, Veller. Though this is a broad topic, we try to concise it, and the outline of the topic includes bisphosphonates, denosumab, octotype, Distortion, systemic steroids, and each of these drugs we look into the pharmacology mechanism of action, their pharmacodynamics and kinetics, their indications and contraindications, their drug interactions, their clinical uses, and also cautions while prescribing these drugs. Coming to the first line, first in the list, bisphosphonates. Bisphosphonates are pyrophosphate stable analogs. There are two phosphonate groups attached to a carbon atom that replaces the oxygen in pyrophosphate. And they have two side chains. One is the R1 hydroxyl side chain and the other one is R2 nitrogen side chain. There are two types of bone cells in the body, osteoblasts, which are for bone formation. The next one is osteoclasts, which are for bone resorption. And they help in preventing the loss of bone density and decrease the risk of fractures and by decreasing the osteoclast mediated bone resorption. Into the classification of bisphosphonates, there are three generations of bisphosphonate. 
first generation or the non nitrogen group which has chlorophenol group the least potent and the drugs are metronate clotronate ectitronate and tiludronate second and third generation bisphosphonates are nitrogen groups second generation is 10 to 100 times more potent than first generation and the drugs included are alendronate amitronate third generation bisphosphonates are 10000 times more potent than the first generation and drugs included are ibandronate ricitronate and zolidronate coming to the roots of administration alendronate ibandronate and ricitronate are given orally whereas zolidronate ibandronate and pamitronate are given intravenously the mechanism of action bisphosphonates in the non nitrogen group act by stimulating osteoclast apoptosis thereby resulting in decrease in the osteoclast number and causing decrease in bone resorption whereas in the nitrogen group that is a second and third generation they inhibit the cholesterol synthetic pathway by decreasing in osteoclast function thereby causing decrease in bone resorption coming to the non uh, nitrogen group bisphosphonates these nitrogen group containing bisphosphonates they help uh, they act by inhibition of the smevalinate pathway for the synthesis of cholesterol by inhibiting this key enzyme carnosyl pyrophosphate synthase within the osteoclast and thereby they are causing osteoclast endocytosis of the bisphosphonates from the bone surface which is causing osteoclast apoptosis and thereby osteoclast bone resorption coming to the pharmacokinetics of the bisphosphonates they are poorly absorbed orally and their intake is further reduced by food when rapid they are rapidly taken up by the skeleton at the sites of bone resorption and where the mineral is exposed and remain there for weeks to months and the remainder is bound to plasma proteins due to the bioavailability it is less than 1% to 6% the substances are non metabolized and are excreted unchanged by the kidneys and eliminated generally within 24 hours they are given orally to be taken after an overnight fast with a glass of water followed by no food for 30 minutes and remaining upright in upright position for 60 minutes for the better absorption next coming to the indications of bisphosphonates bisphosphonates are used in hypercalcemia of malignancy osteolytic bone metastasis to reduce skeletal related events multiple myeloma in the prevention of bone metastasis in post menopausal women with early breast cancer osteoporosis and pages disease the main contraindications are seen when oral during the oral drug administration if the patients have esophageal abnormality whether they have any stricture or eclesia or inability to sit upright for 60 minutes coming to the drug interactions concurrent use along with the following drugs increases the effects of the following when given with aminoglycoside the first one is cause prolonged hypocalcemia and hypomagnesemia when given with loop diuretics hypocalcemia and dehydration occurs and when given with nephrotoxic and thalidomide in multiple myeloma it causes renal impairment coming to the undesirable effects of bisphosphonates they were broadly categorized into very common common and clear usually after intravenous uh, administration of bisphosphonates acute systemic inflammatory reactions happen like fever myalgia arthralgia nausea and vomiting or fatigue sometimes headache anxiety thrombocytopenia when given orally they we see diarrhea or constipation the other common undesirable effects we come across as tachycardia atrial fibrillation osteo necrosis degeneration in renal function and rarely we see ocular inflammation angioedema and tetany before prescribing bisphosphonates the following to be carefully looked into hydrate the patient well measure the following before each dose plasma creatinine serum calcium and albumin levels weight of the patient and then calculate the estimated creatinine clearance and after that calculate the corrected calcium which is by the formula measured calcium plus 0.8 into o minus serum albumin which is measured in mg per deciliter coming to the clinical use and dosage tumor induced hypercalcemia solidronic acid is given at the dosage of 4 mg as intravenous infusion in 100 ml ns or 5% glucose over 15 minutes for refractory hypercalcemia it is given at the dosage of 8 mg 
Alginate is given at the dosage of 90 mg intravenous infusion in 250 to 100 ml, 100 ml of normal saline over four hours. The indication of prophylactic use to reduce the incidence of skeletal related events. Chlorhydrocutanic acid is given at the dosage of 4 mg every three to four weeks, and palmitonate is given at the dosage of 90 mg every three to four weeks. Coming to the dose reduction for zolidronic acid, when in patients with cancer involving the bones and my, with patients with mild to moderate renal impairment, this is based on the calculation of the estimated creatine clearance. If the baseline creatine clearance is more than 60, then the dosage recommended is 4. 50 to 60, it is 3.5. 40 to 49, as it is 3.3. 30 to 39, it is 8. Less than 30, hydronic is not administered. There is a paper which looked into uh, to compare the effic efficacy and safety of zolidronic acid and palmitronate for treated hypercalcemia of malignancy. There's two identical concurrent parallel multicenter randomized double blind uh, trials, and they looked into zolidronic acid 4 mg and also uh, comparing with the palmitronate 90 mg. Now, in patients with mild to moderate uh, severe hypercalcemia, more than 12 mg per deciliter, treated with a single dose of zolidronic acid, either 4 or 8 mg by a 5 minute infusion, or palmitronate by a 2 hour infusion. And they looked into the endpoint of clinical uh, complete response rate by day 10, and they said that zolidronic acid is 88.4%, whereas palmitronate is 69.7%, and zolidronic acid shows statistical, statistical significance. They concluded saying zolidronic acid is superior to palmitronate and given at the dosage of 4 mg for initial treatment and 8 mg for refractory or relapsed hypercalcemia. Come to the use of bisphosphonate as adjuvant analgesia. It is used in metastatic bone pain. Polydronic acid is used at the dosage of 4 mg over 15 minutes. And palmitronate is used at the dosage of 90 mg within one to two weeks. But this use of as adjuvant analgesia of phosphonates is limited because, because of the other drugs in the WHO ladder and also NSAIDs which are used more prominently and the bisphosphonates. And there's a paper, Cochrane Review, which looked into the comparison of bisphosphonates and other bone agents uh, for early breast cancer. In postmenopausal women with early breast cancer without bone metastasis, uh, bisphosphonates are used to reduce the incidence of bone metastasis with significant value, leading to a small improvement in survival. There are insufficient data to show if uh, denosumab increases the survival. But some guidelines recommend bisphosphonates, that is, zolidronic acid 4 mg, every six months as an adjuvant therapy for postmenopausal women with early phase of breast cancer at high risk of recurrence with node positive disease, regardless of their fracture risk. Coming to the ibandronic acid, the main are the two indications where we use ibandronic acid tumor induced hypercalcemia. If corrected calcium is less than mg per deciliter, then 4 mg dose is given. More than 12 mg, more than 4 mg dose is given. For less than 12 mg, a dose of 2 mg intravenous is given, along with as intravenous infusion in 500 ml, 0.9% saline over two hours. For prevention of skeletal related events, it is given at a dosage of uh, with bone metastasis from breast cancer or for moderate to severe bone pain, given at the dosage of 50 mg per orally once daily or given as 6 mg intravenous infusion of 15 minutes every three to four weeks. For patients with renal impairment, based on the severity of the renal impairment, whether it is moderate renal impairment or severe, the dose modification are as follows. Moderate renal impairment with 30 to 50 creat clearance, Vanonate is given orally 50 mg on alternate days. For severe renal impairment, if creat clearance is less than 30 ml, then it is given as 50 mg per orally once a week. And given in, intravenously for moderate renal impairment, abandonate is given as 4 mg every three to four weeks. For severe impairment, the dose is furthermore reduced to 2 mg every three to four weeks. Coming to the cautions while prescribing bisphosphonates, in patients with renal impairment, carefully to look into to correct the hypovolemia before treatment and monitor renal function. 
patients with invasive dental procedures we have the risk of uh, uh, osteonecrosis of jaw and also patients with vitamin d deficiency as it causes increased risk of hypocalcemia Coming to the next group of drugs, which is denosumab. This is a human monoclonal antibody and a rank ligand inhibitor. The mechanism of action is denosumab binds with receptor activator of nuclear factor kappa B ligand, preventing the rank L rank interaction, thereby resulting in reduced osteoclast number and function and decreasing bone resorption and cancer induced bone destruction. Coming to the indications of denosumab, it helps in prevention of skeletal related events in adults with bone metastasis from breast cancer and other solid cancers. Treatment of bone loss in men with prostate cancer receiving androgen deprivation therapy. Prevention of osteoporotic fragility fractures in, fractures in postmenopausal women and for refractory hypercalcemia of malignancy. Coming to the contraindications of denosumab, it is mainly contraindicated in untreated severe hypocalcemia, unhealed lesions from dental or oral surgery. The undesirable effects which we see with denosumab very commonly are breathlessness, diarrhea, and commonly seen are hypocalcemia, osteonecrosis of jaw, and external artery canal. And commonly, we see drug hypersensitivity and typical femoral fracture. Coming to the dose and clinical use. For prevention of skeletal related events in patients with bone metastasis from solid cancers, denosumab is given at a dosage of 120 mg single subcutaneous injection to be repeated every four weekly. For postmenopausal osteoporosis in women at increased risk of fracture, it is given at the dosage of 60 mg subcutaneously once every six months. And for bone loss in men with who are on hormonal, hormonal therapy, also, it is given at 60 mg was every six months. And along with this, we give daily supplementation of 500 mg calcium and 100 m 400 international units of vitamin D unless the patient has hypercalcium. Uses of denosumab, uh, it is superior to zolidronic acid in preventing skeletal related events in patients with bone metastasis, breast cancer, metastatic hormone replace and prostate cancer. Main important thing is, Denosumab can be used in renal impairment without dose adjustment and can be given subcutaneously. There is a paper which looked into adjuvant denosumab in postmenopausal patients with hormone receptor, receptor positive breast cancer. Phase 3 trial, double blinded randomized trial. They had given uh, uh, in postmenopausal patients early hormone receptor positive breast cancer receiving treatment with aromatase inhibitors. Denosumab, STMG over. Placebo, which is given subcutaneously every six months. 58 trial centers have seen, and the primary endpoint they looked into was time to first clinical fracture. Denosumab, it is 92 were reported when compared to uh, 176 in placebo, which is uh, and uh, it showed statistical significance. Thereby, they concluded adjuvant denosumab 60 mg twice per year reduces the risk of clinical fractures in postmenopausal women with breast cancer receiving aromatase inhibitors can be administered without any added toxicity. There is another systematic review which looked into the comparison of domesumab and solidronic acid for the treatment of solid tumors and multiple myeloma with bone metastasis. And it looked into the efficacy and safety between denosumab and solidronic acid or RCTs. The overall analysis when they have done, they concluded in the results saying denosumab was superior to solidronic acid in delaying the time to first skeletal related events and also time to first and subsequent skeletal related events with uh, significant p values. And thereby, they concluded saying, compared to solidronic acid, denosumab is associated with delayed first and subsequent skeletal related events with lower incidence of toxicity, like renal toxicity and acute phase reaction, but higher incidence of hypocalcemia and osteonecrosis of jaw. There is another systematic review with the European Association for Palliative Care Guidelines. It looked into in adults patients with metastatic bone pain, what is the evidence that bisphosphonates and denosumab are effective and safe in controlling pain? And they have looked into nearly 1,585 uh, studies. Uh, and in this, uh, they have concluded 
in the results saying evidence to support an analgesic role for bisphosphonate and denosumab is weak. Bisphosphonates and denosumab appear to be beneficial in preventing pain by delaying the onset of bone pain rather than by producing an analgesic effect per se. Coming to the next drug, octreotide. This is a synthetic hormone and a somatostatin analog. Coming to the pharmacology, octreotide has longer duration of action. Its inhibitory effects in endocrine and GI systems by, via neurotransmission and cell proliferation. In hypothalamus, accreted acts by inhibiting the release of growth hormone, PSH, ACTH, and prolactin. It also inhibits the secretion of insulin, glucagon, gastrin, and other peptides of the gastroenterocardiac system. The mechanism it is uh, octreotides reduces the splanchnic blood flow, portal blood flow gastrointestinal motility, pancreatic and small bowel secretion, and increasing water and electrolyte absorption. It also helps in inhibitory uh, access neurotransmitter in the CNS, has anti-inflammatory and analgesic effects, and also inhibits cellular proliferation. It has direct anti-cancer effect and improves prognosis in patients with neuroendocrine or solid tumors of the gastrointestinal tract. It acts by five somatostatin receptors, SST1 to SST5, mediating and uh, different biological action of somatostatin coupled with G protein. Octetide and lanotide bind with high affinity to SST2 and SST5 and with moderate affinity to SST3. Coming to the pharmacokinetics of octreotide, octreotide can be given either subcutaneously, intramuscularly, intravenously and when given for pain it is given intrathically also. Concept of action is 30 minutes, time to peak plasma concentration is 30 minutes, plasma half-life is 1.5 hours, and duration of action is usually 8 hours. Coming to the drug interactions, it increases the bioavailability of bromocryptin by about 40% and reduces the plasma cyclosporin concentrations and inadequate immunosuppression may result thereby. Coming to the undesirable effects we come across when we Octreotide is prescribed. It causes dry mouth, flat lens, nausea, abdominal pain, diarrhea, impaired gluco glucose tolerance, hyperglycemia, persistent hyperglycemia, sometimes gallstones when given as long term treatment, and pancreatitis, which is associated with gallstones. Coming to the indications of octreotide, it is used in inoperable bowel obstructions in patients with cancer, ascites and cirrhosis in cancer, death rattle. Reduction of tumor related secretions, intractable diarrhea causes high output caused by high output ileostomies, unresectable hormone secreting tumors for carcinoid by improving flushing and diarrhea, glycomas by improving diarrhea, and glucognomas by improving rash and diarrhea, bleeding mesophageal viruses, hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy, bronchorea, and also in fistulas by buccal salivary and intracutaneous. Coming to the clinical uses of octreotide, in an optical bubble obstruction in patients with advanced cancer, they have nausea and vomiting leading to severely impaired oral intake. The paper which looked into clinical efficacy and safety of octreotide in terminally ill patients with malignant bubble obstruction, they have prescribed octreotide 300 microgram over 24 hours subcutaneously as a continuous injection for six days. And out of 25, 11, that is 44%, have responded to the treatment with resolution or improvement of nausea and vomiting. This is another paper which looked into the comparison of octreotide administration versus conservative treatment in the management of inoperable bubble obstruction in patients with far advanced cancer. This is a randomized double blinded control trial. This is the Nistacidu et al. And out of 60, uh, 68 GI tumors was looked into, they were divided into two groups. Group A has received hyacinth butyl bromide and chlorpromazine, whereas group B has received octreotide and chlorpromazine. And they were given some cards to monitor the uh, symptoms of nausea, vomiting, pain, and anorexia. And the symptoms were assessed at various levels. And data analysis, when, has, when taken, it showed statistical significant difference between the two groups. They concluded saying vomiting and nausea in relation to the uh, uh, fatigue and anorexia, it, it had shown significant improvement with a significant p value. Thereby, they concluded saying administration of octreotide is very effective in the symptom management of inoperable bowel obstruction in terminal cancer patients.
This is another paper, a uh, double-blinded placebo controlled randomized trial of octatide in bowel obstruction by Caro et al., which looked into the effect of adding octatide or placebo to standardized therapies for patients with vomiting and inoperable bowel obstruction secondary to cancer or its treatment. There are two arms. One is the octatide arm and the other is the placebo. Octatide arm has received 600 micrograms per day by infusion. And two arms they have received separately in ranitidin, dexamethasone, and also parenteral hydration. 87 participants were monitored for 72 hours. And 17 in the octatide and 14 in the placebo arm were found to be free of vomiting for 72 hours. But the p-value is not significant. But then mean days free of vomiting were 1.87 in the octreted arm and 1.69 in the placebo. The study showed a reduced number of episodes of vomiting in the octreted arm with a significant p-value. And they concluded saying that as there is no reduction in the number of days free of vomiting. The multivariate analysis suggests that furthermore studies be warranted. Coming to the MASCC guidelines update on the medical management of uh, uh, bowel obstruction in patients with advanced cancer, uh, which looked into the management of nausea and vomiting in malignant bowel obstruction. This is a systematic review and three randomized trials were looked into by, from 257 abstracts. And they said octreotide is effective in reducing gastrointestinal secretions and also the colic and thereby reducing nausea and vomiting caused by malignant bowel obstruction concluded saying octreotide is the drug of choice in managing inoperable malignant bowel obstruction. This is published in 2021. Coming to the next clinical use of octreotide ascites, octreotide helps in the reduction of splanchnic blood flow or by inhibiting vascular endothelial growth factor, which increases vascular permeability and also promotes angiogenesis and tumor growth. In patients with rapidly accumulating ascites, octreotide uh, requiring treatment clearances despite audiotic therapy, octreotide helps in uh, reducing the abdominal bloating, discomfort, and shortness of breath, and also thereby reducing the rate of formation of malignant ascites, suppressing the diuretic induced activation of the renin aldosterone angiotensin system, usually prescribed at the dosage of 300 microgram subcutaneously BD. This is a paper which looked into the role of octreotide in prolonging the interval to next parenthesis. It's a pilot RCT study. 23 patients, 16 in the octreotide arm, 17 in the control arm. And then median time to next parenthesis was 28 versus 14 days in the octreotide and placebo arm respectively with the p-value of 0.17, which is not significant. But octreotide treated patients have shown symptom improvement like uh, lesser abdominal bloating, lesser abdominal discomfort, and shortness of breath, which showed significant p-value. They, they concluded long-acting octreotide was reasonably well tolerated, not but not effective in prolonging the time to next parenthesis, but improvements were seen in the symptoms, and further studies were warranted. The other clinical use of octreotide is chemotherapy or radiotherapy induced diarrhea. This is a paper published in uh, ASCO, which is, uh, had given the recommended guidelines for the treatment of cancer uh, treatment induced diarrhea. When they looked into the mild to moderate uh, chemotherapy induced diarrhea, which is not resolved after 24 hours on high dose lopramide after 48 hours, it should be discontinued and the patient should be started on second line anti diarrheal agent that is octreotide, which is given at the dosage of 100 to 150 micrograms at the starting dose with dose escalation as needed. The role of acritide in RT-induced diarrhea is still being investigated. Going to prescribing and administration of octreotide. Octreotide is painful if given a subcutaneous bolus injection. Warming the ample or vial to body temperature before injection by holding in the hand reduces the pain. With continuous subcutaneous infusion, uh, to reduce the likelihood of inflammatory reaction at the skin injection, it can be given diluted with largest volume possible, preferably 0.9% normal saline. Summarizing the indications uh, this, uh, of octreotide use, in, in intestinal obstruction, octreotide is given at the dosage of 250 to 500 micrograms over 24 hours and to be, uh, to be given to a ceiling maximum dose of 600 to microgram per day. The secretary effect, it is given at a dosage of 50 to 100 microgram twice daily, uh, sealing to a dose of maximum dose of 600 micrograms per day. 
pestitis, it is given at the starting dosage of 250 to 500 microgram over a day, leading to a dose of maximum 600 micrograms over 24 hours. to the cautions to be given cautiously in patients with cirrhosis, renal failure requiring dialysis and it leads to reduced elimination. Patients with gallstones and even long, even long term it causes and precipitates biliary colic, whereby gallstones are biliary sludge. In patients with bradycardia, conduction defects or arrhythmias and to monitor thyroid function which causes hypothyroidism and with insulinema because it may exacerbate hypoglycemia. Coming to the next group of drugs, which are progestogens, they are the sex hormones. There are two types of progestogens, natural and synthetic progestogens. Synthetic progestogens include pentin alpha hydroxy progesterone. The drugs included are ciprotyrone, medroxy progesterone acetate, magistrol acetate. These progesterone they improve the appetite by the following mechanisms. Increasing levels of oxygenic neurotransmitters in the hypothalamus by neuropathic Y. Contracting the anorexic effects of cytokines, interfering with the production of cytokines via their glucocorticoid anti-inflammatory effect. And in vitro, these cytokines released from the peripheral blood mononucleosides are inhibited by both medroxyprogesterone and magistral acetate at doses 1500 to 2000 mg of medroxyprogesterone and the 320 to 960 mg of magistral the release of serotonin was also inhibited, thereby causing progesterones have an anti inflammatory effect. Both medroxyprogesterone acetate and magistral acetates are highly protein bound and are mainly bound to albumin. Medroxyprogesterone is metabolized and extensively in the liver and excreted mainly as glucuronides, whereas the magistral acetate is secreted mainly unchanged in the urine. Coming to the pharmacokinetics, both medroxyprogesterone and magistral are uh, given per orally. By availability is 1 to 10% for medroxyprogesterone, plus 25% for magistral estate. Time to peak plasma concentration was 2 to 7 hours for medroxyprogesterone estate, whereas it is 3 to 5 hours for magistral estate. And the plasma half life was 38 to 46 hours for medroxyprogesterone, whereas it is 24 to 42 hours for magistral estate. Coming to the indications. Progestogens are used for anorexia and cachexia and cancer in AIDS, as hormonal therapy in endometrial cancer, breast cancer, and mild to moderate endometriosis, anorexia, uterine bleeding, post castration, hot flushes in both women and men, and for secondary amenorrhea. Contraindications for medroxyprogesterone estate, for estrogen progesterone dependent cancer, during hepatic impairment. With any history of thromboembolism, with acute thrombophibitis, undiagnosed abnormal uterine bleeding, or if there is any suspicious of pregnancy. The undesirable effects most commonly seen and important is thromboembolism, and then hyperglycemia, depression, insomnia, fatigue, hypertension, edema, nausea, vomiting, constipation, and rarely we come across our jaundice, alopecia, and hirsutism. Coming to the indications, the clinical use and dosage. When given as ep for appetite stimulation, magistral estate is given at the dosage of 80 to 160 mg per orally each morning. The dose to be doubled after two weeks if no adequate response is achieved. And maximum dose is given up to 800 mg per orally per day. Medroxyprogesterone estate is given at a dosage of 400 mg per orally each morning for appetite stimulation. Hot flushes after surgical or chemical castration. Medroxyprogesterone estate is magistral estate is given at the dosage of 80 mg each morning. Effect manifests after two to four weeks. Whereas medroxyprogesterone estate is given at the dosage of 5 to 20 mg BD to QID. There is a Cochrane systematic review, which is on magistral acetate for the treatment of anorexia and cachexia syndrome to evaluate the efficacy and effectiveness of the safety of magistral estate in palliating anorexia and cachexia in patients with cancer. The meta-analysis which showed a benefit of magistral estate compared with the placebo. And they, their results showed appetite improvement and weight gain in cancer and quality of life improvement. But there were some side effects which came across with magistral estate like edema, thromboembolic phenomena, and death. There were conclusions said 
Magistral estate improves appetite and is associated with slight weight gain in cancer. In patients who are receiving palliative care, should be informed the risk involved in prescribing and in taking magistral estate. Coming to the cautions of progestogens, it may suppress the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the possibility of glucocorticoid effects, and may cause a worsen diabetes. Medroxyprostrone estate, uh, if the, uh, discontinue if there is any jaundice, hepatic impairment, significant increase in blood pressure, or any thromboembolic events. Sometimes it may exacerbate hypercalcemia, migraine, epilepsy. Magistral estate uh, could be used cautiously with patients with thrombophobic and severe hepatic impairment. Coming to the last and final group of drugs, which are corticosteroids. The adrenal cortex secretes hydrocortisone, which has glucocorticoid activity and may mineralocorticoid activity, and also secretes aldosterone, which has a mineralocorticoid activity. Due to their anti-inflammatory mechanism of action, they provide effective analgesia for pain associated with inflammation and in the management of cancer-related implications such as brain metastasis and spinal cord compression. Prednisolone, which is most frequently used, corticosteroid for disease suppression. Examethasone, which is high glucocorticoid activity but insignificant mineralocorticoid effect, has high dose anti-inflammatory therapy. Hydrocortisone is used for moderate anti-inflammatory effect, mostly used topically. Betamethasone, meclomethasone also used topically. Going to the pharmacokinetics. Hydrocortisone 20 mg is equivalent to 5 mg of prednisolone and 0.5 to 1 mg of dexamethasone. Oral bioavailability is highest for hydrocortisone, which is 96. And duration of action in hours, dexamethasone uh, has the longest duration of action with 36 to 56 hours, and we use dexamethasone more frequently in our practice. Coming to the indications of corticosteroids, more specifically, it is used in spinal cord compression, supreted vena cavil obstruction, nerve compression, restlessness uh, with pneumonitis, lymphangitis, carcinomatosis, critical compression or strider. An obstruction of hollow viscous by any bronchus, ureter, or uh, GI obstruction, and to improve appetite, discharge from the rectal tumor, and importantly, in brain metastasis, nausea and vomiting in cancer and cancer induced chemotherapy induced nausea, vomiting, hematological malignancies, and intraproliferative disorders. Coming to the contraindications, corticosteroids can be prescribed in systemic infection. Unless they are considered to be life saving and specific anti infective therapy is employed. Coming to the drug interactions and their effects, corticosteroids, when they're given with beta 2 agonists, cause hypokalemia. When given with anti epileptics and rifampicins, their metabolism is accelerated. Patients who are already taking warfarin with corticosteroids can cause increasing the INR. Oral hypoglycemics and insulin by the glucocorticoid effect, and antihypertensives and di diuretics by their mineral corticoid effect. Coming to the various side effects of uh, corticosteroids, these were divided into three groups glucocorticoid, mineral corticoid, and cushingoid. You see in the picture, by the glucocorticoid effects, they can cause a vascular necrosis of bone and then uh, attract. Glaucoma, diabetes mellitus, infection, then osteoporosis, peptic ulceration, and uh, suppression of growth. Mineralocorticoid effects, they can cause hypokalemia and sodium and water retention, causing edema and hypertension. By the Cushingoid features, they cause acne, bruising, hysterism, and then striae, leopodystrophy. Coming to the clinical use and dosage of uh, corticosteroids, and given as uh, for appetite stimulants, corticosteroids are beneficial in treating anorexia and palliative care patients with malignancies. Dexamethasone is given at the dosage of 2 to 6 mg. Prednisolone is given at the dosage of 40 to 50, 15 to 40 mg each morning. There's a paper which looked into the uh, uh, prednisolone as an appetite stimulant in patients with cancer. It's a double-blinded crossover trial. Prednisolone was prescribed 15 mg daily over two weeks and third week when the dosage was reduced. And placebo was given one tablet thrice daily for two weeks. Though the numbers were small when we looked as we as per the table, they but they comparison after that they looked, they concluded saying prednisolone had shown they are significantly better than placebo in improving the appetite in patients with cancer in short term with significant p-values. 
Coming to the next clinical uh, use for, uh, for nausea and vomiting, for simply a chemotherapeutic vomiting, is by mediating, mediated by a corticosteroid induced reaction by permeability of a chemoreceptor uh, trigger zone and blood brain barrier to emetogenic substances, reduction in the neuronal content of gamma amino butyric acid in the brain stem. These are the ASCO guidelines on antiemetics. Antiemetic dosage for adults by antineoplastic risk, based on the risk stratification of the antineoplastic risk for high risk uh, chemotherapeutic drugs, DEXA is given at the dosage of 12 to 20 mg oral or IV. Moderate to low risk, it is given at the dosage of 80 mg oral or intravenously. For patients who are on radiotherapy, dexamethasone is prescribed for high risk like total body radiation at the dosage of 4 mg oral or IV once daily. Uh, before the radiation. For moderate risk for patients who are receiving craniospinal radiation in upper abdomen, it is given at the dosage of 4 mg oral or IV only during the first few, five fractions before radiation. For low risk like brain, head and neck, thorax and pelvis, dexamethasone is given at the dosage of 4 mg for brain and for the other regions 4 mg and the ceiling dose can be up to 16 mg oral or IV to be given before radiation for the initial few fractions. To the clinical use of corticosteroids or obst uh, for obstructive syndrome to reduce the inflammation at the site of obstruction by increasing the lumen of the obstructed hollow viscous. Corticosteroids are given at the dose equivalent or uh, DEXA equivalent to 6 to 16 mg per day IV and may improve bowel obstruction but it cannot affect the survival. High dose corticosteroids at the dosage of 20 to 40 mg per day were, were uh, show, show to relieve strider with upper airway obstructions from infiltrating tumors. Case reports were there, but data still warranted. Coming to the clinical use of uh, corticosteroids in brain metastasis, it is used in dexa uh, dexamethasone is used in treatment of symptomatic brain meds, whereas no benefit is seen with asymptomatic. For mild symptoms, it is given at the dosage of 4 to 8 mg per day reduce uh, the cerebral edema from the uh, raised intracranial pressure. For sim severe symptoms, it is given at the dosage of 16 mg per day. Symptom relief from dexamethasone reduces over time and undesirable effects increase. So if patients were not on palliative RT, they will experience a recurrence of their symptoms at some point as the dose of dexamethasone is decreased. So it is necessary always to carefully look into and taper more slowly or continue maintenance dexa indefinitely in some patients. In patients who are on therapy, dexamethasone should be continued for one week after treatment and then tapered over two to four weeks. The another clinical use of uh, spinal cord compression, dexamethasone is a corticosteroid of choice and it is given at the dosage of uh, as a stat dose of 16 mg per orally and to be continued 16 mg each morning for further three to four days. If there is any neurological deterioration during the dose reduction, Dose should be increased again to the previous satisfactory dose, maintained at the level for the further two weeks before attempting to taper the dose again. About one out of four require maintenance dexamethasone in order to preserve neural function. In the paper by Sorensen, which looked into the effect of high dose dexamethasone and astromatous metastatic spinal cord compression treated with radiotherapy, looked into the response to steroids as a good prognostic factor. Loading dose of 10 to 16 mg DEXA was given and maintenance dose of 4 to 16 mg intravenously, 6 h to QHH and O2 to to oral after 24 to 48 hours. And they concluded high dose dexamethasone with RT versus RT alone. Steroids with RT arm had significant improvement in ambulatory status at six months, which was 59% over 66%. This is a Cochrane systemic review on treatment of metastatic extradural spinal cord compression. This is published by CMC, uh, uh, in my professors in the care department. High dose 96 mg and 100 mg bolus versus moderate dose 10 mg and 16 mg for no, no corticosteroids for adults with metastatic extradural spinal cord compression was looked into. They said high dose corticosteroids did not offer any beneficial effects compared to the moderate dose in enhancing the ambulation, long-term survival, and in reducing the pain. But the serious adverse effects, which they looked into with high-dose steroids were more, which is six out of 36, that is 17%, but there were no adverse effects seen with moderate dose or no dose. 
so they provide little or no more benefit than 16 mg associated with a uh, definite risk of a major uh, adverse event particularly with respect to acute gi perforation and also gi hemorrhage and sepsis psychosis and possibly even death this is another cochrane uh, systematic review which uh, looked into the efficacy of corticosteroids in treating cancer related pain in adult patients with cancer It, uh, it, uh, in the study, they uh, showed it resulted in less pain in the me when measured on a scale of zero to ten, with the lowest scale indicating less pain compared to control at one week. This point eight four to uh, lower and uh, it showed statistical significance. They concluded saying the evidence for the efficacy of corticosteroids for pain control in cancer patients is weak. And significant pain relief was only seen for a shorter period of time. This is another clinical use of corticosteroids, rectal tumor, or acute uh, post-radiation proctitis. It helps in discharge from reducing the discharge from the rectal tumor or acute post-radiation proctitis. Corticosteroids are prescribed as detention enema of hydrocortisone acetate, 125 mg rectally, or prednisolone, 20 mg rectally, every one to two days. If local application is impractical, then peroral corticosteroids can be used instead. This is a, uh, a review evidence-based uh, quality use of corticosteroids in the palliative care of patients with advanced cancer, which is published in 2021 in Palliative Medicine Journal. And they said current evidence of uh, use of corticosteroids for the management of uh, various indications which we have looked into, like spinal cord compression, raised ICT, malignant bowel obstruction. But importantly, a short trial of corticosteroids is indicated in the management of pain and cancer-related anorexia, but the benefit. If any of corticosteroids for the palliation of other symptoms remains unknown, so they said low dose corticosteroids when used for less than two weeks are unlikely to be associated with any toxicity. Mostly, whereas dose-related adverse effects are seen after three to four weeks. Coming to the uh, administration and prescribing uh, corticosteroids, they are to be prescribed cautiously for defined symptoms potentially responsive to corticosteroid therapy. Always bearing in mind the potential benefits versus risks. At a lower to moderate dose, titrated to the clinical effect needed. A time limited trial and discontinued if no clinical or symptomatic benefit is seen, or been to a lowest effective dose when needed. Cautions while prescribing corticosteroids. Uh, in patients with diabetes mellitus and psychotic illness, in patients who are uh, long course of corticosteroids increase susceptibility of infection. All patients who are already had peritonitis, which where infection can be masked, or with septicemia and tuberculosis, where serious infections can even lead to death. And, uh, with, along with live vaccines, corticosteroids should not be given as antibody response to other vaccine may be diminished. Coming to the recommendations for withdrawal. Uh, systemic corticosteroids, gradual withdrawal in patients who have received more than three weeks of treatment and who have received high dose of uh, prednisolone per day or equivalent, like dexamethasone four to six mg, who had a second dose in the evening and who have received repeated treatments, and who have taken a short course within one year of stopping long-term treatment, abrupt withdrawal of corticosteroids in patients who have received treatment for less than three weeks. But the patient should be monitored. Carefully during withdrawal in case of any deterioration. Coming to the cost of various drugs, which we have looked into in India, Nasumab for dosage of 60 mg cost per dose would be 16 16,000. When given monthly 120 mg dose, cost 32,000. Polytonic acid 4 mg dose cost nearly 900 897 rupees. When given monthly, it costs 897. Ibuprofen. Acid per oral 150 mg costs 150 rupees, so monthly it is 150. Octreotide at the dosage of 200 micrograms it costs 935 rupees. So when given BD or TID for two or three days itself it costs more. Dexamethasone in injection 8 mg costs 16 rupees. Medroxyprednisone estate 10 mg costs six rupees and Medrocyl estate 160 mg costs 110. When given monthly, my case it costs. Three thousand three hundred rupees, which is more cost. Coming to the take-home message, palliative physicians should be aware of the various uses of different 
endocrine drugs with their indications and their implications on palliative care setting and thereby they should uh, use them judiciously considering risk versus benefit and the financial burden thank you excellent susan excellent lecture it was too good and your last slide was so impressive the giving the cost of various drugs so that people can decide based on the cost also it was too good so dr yes. jennifer can you take up the uh, discussion ahead there are a lot of questions you can go ahead with the and comments also good comments very good thank you thank you susan for <clears throat> making it putting it all together especially with so many drugs and uh, yeah indications cautions yeah so like uh, the last slide i think is the most important one just to reiterate that as palliative care physicians we need to be aware of uh, lots of new drugs that are coming up as uh, not necessarily adjuvants but as co therapies in many of our palliative care uh, settings and most of the drugs uh, which we discussed to give today would fall into that category so for every patient we see we need to really see if there is is there an indication for any other uh, medication that will possibly improve their symptom control or their survival or their quality of life for any of their symptoms but uh, as we have mentioned here uh, this uh, what is important to look at is to carefully choose patients considering their risks benefits and especially their cost because often new drugs take off very quickly because of the marketing and just because it's costly people think it might have a great um, uh, benefit so that has to be carefully considered so coming to the questions i think uh, one question was on uh, uh, by dr rajesh was on uh, renal impairment in multiple myeloma other than denosumab so denosumab the greatest advantage is uh, it can be used in patients with renal impairment but however like you see the cost comes up to uh, 30 32000 per month uh, so in patients with renal impairment we know considering the creatinine clearance solidronic acid in adjusted doses can be given uh, when the creatinine clearance is up to 30 but when it goes below 30 then solidronic acid is out of question uh, ibendronate is another drug which also needs to be used cautiously but like we saw can be used in patients with severe renal impairment in adjusted doses uh, like 2 mg iv every 3 to 4 weeks or 50 mg orally in um, in um, per week so that is uh, what i would say about uh, in renal impairment use of other drugs especially in those who cannot afford denosumab the next question was on osteoblastic uh, meds so the evidence for zolidronic acid is mostly uh, in osteolytic meds in breast and uh, multiple myeloma but uh, there are uh, there are uh, um we uh, we really the evidence for use in all solid cancers is not really very strong but uh, we see more and more that bisphosphonates are used with bone metastases uh, in other solid cancers also other than breast and prostate and uh, multiple myeloma um any comparison of octreotide with uh buscopan i think there was one study sir on uh, with where she put hyosin versus uh, octreotide uh, the evidence really uh, in terms of symptom control it is slightly better but in terms of resolution of the obstruction or uh, the survival there is uh, really not much difference Uh, sorry i uh, dr anju has asked a question on comparison of giving bolus uh, glycopyrrolate to continuous subcutaneous infusion uh, i have no personal experience i would uh, request if anybody else has uh, any comments on that i'll open it up little later 
Dr. Stanley has uh, mentioned he has used DEXA 4 to 8 MD subcutaneously weekly in home care. Uh, again, I would ask Dr. Stanley to comment on that um, indication for what it was used, whether it was for bowel obstruction or anything. So, would you like to? It's mainly <clears throat> uh, for improving appetite and also a sense of well being. And, and, and we didn't use it in the initial stages, but our patients started asking for it, you know. <laughs> they said they, they would be waiting for our visit, you know, by, because by four or five days that effect is gone or it is reducing and they're look, waiting for that injection. So we started giving it and we were giving it, if we could give it IV, then we would do it IV, but uh, even subcut because sometimes it can cause a little pain at the site. And also in, in malignant bowel obstruction, uh, we have used uh, buscopan effectively, you know, every for, you know, according in, in that 10 ml syringe, we have combined it with other drugs and used it effectively because the cost is the main problem. Yes. Thank you, sir, for that. Yes, uh, definitely buscopan has a definite role in malignant bowel obstruction and the cost you certainly can't compare because octreotide, if we were to give it as even uh, 600 micrograms per day, um, it comes to around uh, 3,000 rupees per day. So it is exorbitant. Uh, so that is why these drugs need to be considered very, very carefully. So buscopan definitely consider in those with colic or complete bubble obstruction. Regarding steroids, I really encourage you all to go read this practice review paper uh, in the Palliative Medicine Journal 2021. They've nicely classified it as uh, for different indication, do's, don'ts and don't know. So actually there's much more in, a, in the don't know section than the do's and the don'ts. So even uh, things like quality of life, anorexia, <clears throat> there is some very weak, uh, very weak evidence. Uh, so when they've studied the uh, use of DEXA for anorexia, they also found that there was a sense of uh, well-being, uh, though that itself was not primarily studied as a primary endpoint. So I think that uh, when we consider corticosteroids, I think rational prescribing and what that article recommends is actually to uh, look for quality prescribing is something that we need to look at. Uh, we need to consider when uh, we use corticosteroids for different uh, settings. Uh, I said, we'll come back to something. Um, Question you have said that you have said that. Before Dr. Stanley, there was somebody. Yeah, uh, Doctor, anybody would like to comment on uh, comparison of giving bolus versus continuous subcutaneous infusion of glyco glycopyrrolate? I think the general advantage of giving any medication as continuous subcute will apply, but uh, any uh, personal experiences on this? Uh, Anybody on the Zoom? Um, I think, <coughs> excuse me. I think um, giving uh, regular subcut medicines, you know, as compared to continuous infusion is well established in, in our practice in India, I think. You know, uh, because if you use the drug, depending on its, uh, you know, action, you know, for how many hours and you give it accordingly. So if you take morphine, for example, and use that as our standard, every four hours, if we use this combination, it works. You know, it really works. It really helps. So glycopyrrolate also can be added in there. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's another question uh, on corticosteroid efficacy. We know it's effective in vasogenic cerebral edema. Uh, how effective or does it actually have an effect on cerebral cytotoxic edema for metastatic brain lesions? Um, that's a very kind of a too specific question, which I do not have a direct answer. Uh, we know that uh, one of the recommendations of corticosteroids definitely is in uh, brain metastasis, doses going up to 16 milligrams depending on uh, the severity of the raised intracranial tension, but how effective it is due to different causes of edema, 
um, I am unable to comment. I think the, the other principle in prescribing corticosteroids is, see, is to assess its benefit. You know, we always review after starting to see whether you've got the benefit, what you are uh, looking for, and uh, you need to stop quickly if it is not showing benefit. So I think that would apply in this setting as well. If it's really not helping, then there is no point continuing that drug. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jennifer. I think uh, this was absolutely a fantastic lecture given by Susan and moderated by you. You have answered all the queries very well. And I think everybody was very, uh, actually when they are satisfied and they are, well, uh, today there was a lot of information which really a resident should know. And I was just thinking today uh, 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 while listening to this lecture that how lucky our residents are and young palliative care physician and ourselves we are that these kind of lectures give a lot of information concise information on one platform in one hour. So I just want to, before closing this session, I just want to inform all the speakers of this series that uh, uh, all the lectures, because every uh, lecture is almost uh, of highest quality. So if there will be, uh, there will be uh, some quality improvement, it will happen. But all these lectures will also, you have to repeat on the uh, National Board of Examination platform. So, Susan, remember that one day your turn will come that you have to repeat the same lecture on DNB for the DNB students. And in this platform, it will not be only palliative medicine DNB. In this medicine DNB, neurology DNB, pul pulmonary medicine DNB, radiation oncology, medical oncology, everyone will be listening for you. So, all the speakers, those who have presented before and those who are going to present in future, they should remember this fact and they should prepare their lectures accordingly uh, for the National Board of Examination platform. And you will get a chance and very soon you will get a chance for this. Thank you very much, Dr. Jennifer. It was so good. It was fantastic. And uh, I was really thrilled to listen to Susan. Susan, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.